another edition of our webinar. Uh, we have three guests here. It's going to be an excited conversation. Uh, those heavy, uh, scary times uh, looking for efficiency. But let's try to leave this with uh, something constructive. Let's try to learn uh, something at the end of this conversation today. We're excited to have you all on board. Uh, feel free to share on the chat uh, where you, 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 you're reaching us from. Uh, we always like to know where uh, people are uh, spending some time dedicating to learn with us, to share with us, to ask questions. Uh, quick uh, housekeeping before we start. There's going to be people from the birdie team organizing the chat, so feel free to post any question at any time you want. At the end of this time, we're going to have a 10-minute Q&A, so we're going to bring the questions that are not answered throughout the conversation at the end. Uh, feel free just to shoot. For those of you who, who, who don't, don't know me, uh, I'm Pence, one of the co-founders, work with the, the product team here at Birdie. And Birdie is a feedback, uh, a product feedback analytics platform designed to help product teams to make better decisions. Our solution creates a feedback river, centralizing and bringing to the center of your control uh, the voice of customer, so all the sources of feedback from users, and make it easy to explore to extract information to support your decisions. So uh, help us join us uh, in this mission. If you want to, to build uh, better products and better services for our clients, uh, just check it out in our website, birdie.ai. We're gonna be happy uh, to connect with you at some point later. So let's go without any further ado. I'm gonna ask our panelists to introduce themselves, starting from the A, Antonia, welcome. Yes, hi, thank you so much. And thank you for having me on this lovely panel with my lovely co-panelists. Um, my name is Antonia, um, I'm Berlin-based. I've been in product ops for quite a while, uh, relatively speaking. And I now aim to help many companies in their product ops mission um, by doing this in a consulting and coaching fashion. So very happy to be here. Okay, we're happy with you uh, with us. David, want to go next? Yeah, sure. So I'm David Pereira, based in Munich. I've been in the product world for a while now, different parts. Started as a software engineer, then worked as a product owner, product manager, head of product, CPO. Let's say I have seen a lot and have done a lot of mistakes, have learned what works, what doesn't work. And I keep sharing my insights and learnings on social media and try helping companies create value and avoid creating crap so to say <laughs> that's what makes the journey interesting right yeah making mistakes learning from them doing better the next time amazing hugo the floor is yours yeah so hi everyone i'm hugo happy to be here and uh, my background is actually from design but i've been working in product organizations for quite a while now and in the last four or five years i've moved into the operations roles and working in product operations as well um, and yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm working to enable better product teams basically. And, you know, just like everyone else here, I, I think I share uh, my opinions on social media, uh, feel free to connect as well, you know, cause I'm always happy to hear new, you know, connect to new people and, and hear new ideas and yeah, I'm happy to be here. That's great. Thank you everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's great to have you, you all on board. Uh, I have a surprise for uh, uh, all of uh, the folks uh, watching us today. Uh, today we're going to speak in Portuguese. Uh, no, just, just kidding. Hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Not going to happen. Okay. So it's great to, to be with you uh, here. And let's start. Let's start with the, the scenario, with the background, right? So we're talking layoffs, bank crisis, uh, new technology, uh, generative AI, uh, changing the way we, we think about things. So much uncertainty, so much pressure, uh, so much uh, uh, concerns about uh, getting more efficient, uh, getting more uh, profitable. What should be the role of product uh, in it? How can product managers help to uh, decrease this feeling or, I don't know, drive better results uh, out of this situation? Uh, Antonio, wanna go first? Yeah, um, so I think we're going to see a slight shift towards product managers needing to become a little bit more business focused. And honestly, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I think whereas in previous years, 
we we didn't know how good we had it actually we were able to to do things in quite a luxurious manner and right some companies focused very heavily on growth at all costs some companies focused very heavily on innovation innovation labs heavy experimentation a b test absolutely everything um and now we still are able to do those things but we need to have a strong business case for it mm -hmm. right and i think that is the shift like the the nature of product management isn't necessarily going to change in my opinion but it's going to be more about how can we prove that what we do and the time and money we, we invest in something will actually get us to a better place financially in the whole organization yeah, make, make, makes a lot of sense. Isn't that what product should be all about since the beginning, right? Driving business outcomes, uh, but it makes it makes a lot of sense. The pressure is the driver of innovation. Maybe, maybe we can get better results faster uh, that way. David, Hugo, want to join? Sure. Uh, I agree with that. And I think for some time now, product managers have been kind of a build trap. Many product managers descended to something I call as a backlog manager. So mm -hmm. delivering more is what matters. Meeting deadlines, define success, and so on. As Antonio said, we don't have this luxury anymore. So I think now product discovery gets more attention. And some product managers have to learn that because they were so focused on delivery. And now we need to learn what creates value and focus on that and ensure that we are not wasting our energy and something that is not going to help actually deliver business outcome. Yeah, um, I, I agree, obviously. And, and I think, you know, we were kind of needing the shakeup. I think things were too comfortable, maybe. Um, I, I mean, it's not comfortable, right? We all hate that, that it's happening, but I think we needed the shakeup. Um, but the truth of the matter is, you know, I think even the discovery part that David, David was talking about was, even there, we have to actually be more conscious about how we do discovery, right? So we can't be spending hours or years or weeks or months talking about something and, oh, maybe it's an idea. We'll have another meeting. We'll have another ideation session and things like that, right? No, you, you have to build stuff. You know, you have to make money. And, and that's the, the simple truth, right? We have to focus a bit more on that. So, um, you know, suddenly it's not just you know, we, we can't sit back and expect that, oh, it's someone will invest in the company. We'll just keep growing, right? It's it's yeah. not that easy anymore. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think like it's it's really interesting to kind of see this mindset shift, right? Because up until now, or at least what I've experienced, it's been product management is solving user problems, right? Like customer first, everything, and that's fantastic. But that's not the whole sentence, right? It's solving user problems in a way that serves the business, and now. That second part of the sentence is becoming more prevalent. More prevalent okay. at the point that maybe serving the business will uh, uh, replace solving a, a user uh, need or not necessarily? I think it shouldn't. Let you hope um, not, right? <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's that simple, right? We we've forgotten one thing so in this whole thing of being user-centered mm -hmm. um right we also forgot that the idea of being user-centered was also giving them something that would generate cash for the business right or else the business can't actually have exist right um but previously the company could exist because they didn't have to be cash flow positive right they didn't have to be <laughs> now they have to right and so now you see companies making this shift where they have to try and reach that cash flow positive right and and it's a totally different shift to what we had a year ago where everybody was like, oh, no, it's not a problem. You know, I'll get someone to invest in something. They, it was all around the opportunity. That it's every, if everything around what we could be, you know, our valuation. It's not what we are right now. Um, and so most companies were actually working at a loss if we think about it that way. Yeah. Trying to connect the dots here. Uh, we mentioned uh, teams will have to learn how to do proper discovery. Discovery driven by business expectation, business uh, outcomes, expected outcomes. Uh, at the same time, we mentioned uh, 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 changing from managing backlogs that are requests coming from business people, uh, usually. Thinking about this business mindset, what is changing? Uh, the concerns, the priorities, 
uh, is this uh, a scenario of so much pressure changing how business drive questions or, or create demand uh, from product management? Are you guys seeing something different? I, I know we are in completely different company sizes, so it's going to be interesting uh, to learn a little bit of uh, everything. Uh, can we start with uh, maybe Antonia talking a little bit about consultancy field and so many different companies, so many different clients, different scenarios? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so I think what we also need to remind ourselves of is that, yes, we are comparatively speaking in a crisis. A lot of people have been laid off, right? A lot of companies are tightening their belts, but that doesn't mean that growth isn't happening. It's maybe slower, it's maybe more deliberate, but there are still companies on a hiring spree. There are still companies investing heavily into things that might not immediately make them money, right? So I think that the main thing to me that has changed is framing it, right? Now, like previously, we might have just done an innovation lab because it was cool, right? Mm -hmm. Now we're going to have to say we're willing to invest that money because we think, you know, it will give us this financially in two to five years, right? And I think that's that's the main difference we're seeing. David, how is it going in the startup field? Yeah, um, so it's more like looking at it. We need to know why we are doing and how that is going to create business outcome because we know that uh, getting funds is not simple anymore. So yeah. it, if we, we, we better make this right because if we don't make this right, we may not get another round of funds. So then we are all promoted to the market. So now it's like very simple. No, it's kind of getting back to basics. There is this beautiful Venn diagram, business, tech, and customer. And I I feel like for a while, there, there was a kind of thing when Antonio was saying user centricity, I was in the consultancy for, for some years also. And I have seen the other side of the coin, business centricity, but ignoring the user and just doing things for the sake of pleasing business stakeholders. And then it ended up that that didn't match with what the users needed. But now we need to get this equation right. So I think this is what is changing. So we are my, more mindful of our time and investment and trying to find the sweet spot sooner because kind of in the past was a bet. Let's just hope for the best. This sounds cool. Uh, let's try to make it right. And maybe it works. And no one was really taking it serious, like testing assumptions and naming what is uh, are the, the risks ahead of us and so on. But now it's more serious. We need to do more testing and uh, dropping ideas that won't create business value and user value as soon as possible. Who would say? Yeah, I think, yeah. sorry, I, I think the really interesting thing here is that we're actually going back to pure product management, right? Like this fail fast, fail early, fail often, because we do not have the luxury to build something for three months and then figure out nobody wanted it. Yep. In the big enterprises market, Hugo, anything different than that? Um, I, I think it's similar to what Antonio was saying, right? So what happens is the big organizations are basically locking down on the things that they're good at. And they're probably going to be working to making those really more solid, more structured, and you know, make sure that they're, 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 they're ready for the future, right? And potentially building up their, their space so that they're even more comfortable when the smaller competitors come back in. Yeah. Um, but when we talk about, but like Antonio was saying, the growth is happening, right? So it'll be about looking at, okay, but where can we start exploring these new things, but in a more cautious way, right? So we'll start looking at these things and testing them out, but we do it in a more, um, you know, objective way, right? It's not just, let's just do anything and let's go crazy. And there's hundred opportunities. Oh, wait, we wasted a, a couple of thousand here, a couple of thousand there, right? Now it's okay. Let's, let's actually be careful about how we're going to be doing this, right? Um, but I mean, there are a lot of companies that are prepared for it, right? And they're, they're actually in a good spot and they, they can do that. There are other companies that will suffer with this because, you know, obviously, um, you know, the same thing happened in 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008, right? Everything that was extras, luxury or hobbies suffered. 
You know, we, we saw it happening, right? We also saw where suddenly everything that was uh, McDonald's stocks went up, right? McDonald's was selling like crazy, showing profit because it was the cheapest meals outside of your house, <laughs> right? They were keeping everything below like the five euros at the time, right? And I remember that. And so you could see they were having profits, but every other restaurant was starting to close and having issues and having losses. We'll, we'll potentially see the same thing, right? We'll, we'll see these adjustments uh, to how people react to the things. So. I was gonna bring something about the PM skills, product management skills to navigate these waters. And we talked a lot about going back to basics, the way you used to be in the early days of product management. I'm pretty sure we have a lot of folks watching us here who are from this new product management school, right? So uh, coming in to the, the, the profession, to the area uh, recently, maybe the only path they know is this uh, hyper growth uh, instead of necessarily uh, creating results, uh, we need to bring attention, uh, show interaction. Uh, let, let's go back a little bit. What are the, the main skills, mindsets a good PM should have in place uh, in order to navigate in, in this routine, these tasks, these, these challenges? Uh, Hugo. It's a hard one. It's, yeah. it's a hard one because um, up until now and, and during this growth phase and, and you know, we, we saw it right across every th single career in tech and in product, yeah. it was easy to grow to, you know, to get to the next position. It was easy to, oh, here I'm not evolving enough. I've jumped to the next position and now I'm a lead or I'm a manager. I'm suddenly a director, whatever, right? People can't hide behind that anymore, right? So now they have to be effective in the way they do things. So, you know, I, I think what will be important are people who are, are connected to metrics, right? They're connected to data, they're connected to metrics, they're connected to insights that are coming from customers, you know, people can do that and actually, and not it's not just, oh, we've got 500 insights. No, it's what are those insights that are actually solving a problem, right? Actual insights, you know, reading between the lines, looking deeply and extracting that from there, right? Because if it was easy, and this is one of the things I tell designers as well, getting insights, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And everybody thinks they can do it, but it's not. It's really a hard thing to do. Um, you know, really getting to the problem, to the gist of the actual problem. Um, but then, you know, and, and this is one of the things I see in enterprise level. And it's one of the challenges I always put towards product folks is, um, you know, do you, thinking about startups, like De David was saying, right? Startups, five people sit in a room and they build an entire product. You reach enterprise level, you're talking about 500 people in a building and they move less and innovate less and do less than that startup team. And you're like, how is that possible, right? And so they have to kind of shift their thinking there and start thinking, hold on, but how can I be scrappy? How can I actually make things result, right? How can I do this? Um, you know, and it, it's like, like that thing, people talk about usability tests, A-B tests and everything, but nobody does these things of white door tests, you know, nobody does this thing of co-design or, you know, guerrilla testing and you're like, there's a whole world out there, you know, you can explore this stuff. So I think people have to start thinking about this different way of, of, of approaching it, which is what we were doing in the beginning, right? A couple of years ago. Um, yeah, we just got too comfortable again. Yeah. David, you mentioned earlier, uh, learn how to do discovery and connecting with what uh, uh, Hugo just said. It's not easy to get insights. And sometimes it's not easy to properly frame the product you're trying to solve or the, the question you're trying to answer. Uh, of course, we can always uh, drill down, uh, trying to get some explanation regarding the why, but getting the proper what, right? The, the, the right question to be answered, the one that's gonna make the difference, the one that's gonna generate impact is hard. Uh, any, any tips on how to plan, how to get clear directions before investing time in exploration, yeah. search, Discovery. One of the mistakes I see with discovery is doing that without knowing where you want to land. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to achieve uh, at the end of a discovery? So are you pursuing retention, growth, mm -hmm. or what is the ultimate goal? And then you need to find the opportunities that are related to that. Because a good PM for me is the one who can quickly drop the ideas unrelated to what you are pursuing because there will be many things ahead of you and you need to drop the ones that are distraction because people just talk around and then we have meetings to talk about insights and so on so a good pm will say that's where we're going the goal now 
crisis is retention. We're not going to go. So mm -hmm. let's figure out how we can retain our customer base and then do a discover related to that and then prioritize insights to this. And then you can go. But you need to, to have your kind of North Star metric. And I see a common mistake of not having that. So good PMs for me, they are entrepreneurs. They focus on one thing. They go there, make decisions, and they communicate very well with the others. And by communication, I say, you know what you communicate to whom and when and how. So you're not just bombarding everyone with all the information you have and confusing everyone. You give precise information, kind of information on demand. Antonia, yeah. how do you see um, that ch challenge for communication? Communication is a key part of the product management role, right? Uh, yeah, just absolutely. For communication effectively. I mean, I, I could talk for hours about effective communication. I think what David said is exactly right on the money, right? What do you communicate to whom and how often and when, right? Like it's, you cannot just write four paragraphs and expect everybody from your CEO to somebody in customer success to your other peer PM to first of all, be interested and to understand what you're going on about, right? I think especially when it comes to communication, we are so often blinded by our own experience and it's because it's us writing it, right? Like it's, it's natural. We just, we communicate all the time by just speaking, but especially written communication, it's all about what are you trying to achieve with this piece? Who needs to read this and how can you make sure that it's delivered in a format where they will actually read it and they get all the information they need, right? It's readability, it's jargon, it's level of detail, it's frequency, it's the tool you use even. It's, there are so many different aspects to really excellent communication that hits the mark. I think it's really important to remember. Yeah. We talked about a lot of things that are related to how people work, how people, what, what people do in product management. Something that is changing and that is going to dramatically, dramatically change the way we do things is new technologies, generative AI. So we're talking now chat GPT, Google Bard, and everything embedded in Microsoft 365, helping you writing uh, more effectively emails, sharing information. How do you see this changing uh, the daily routine of a product management? And I want to add, do you guys see do have any, any concern on, okay, just trust with these things. What are the yellow flags uh, we should have when adopting those new technologies? So what changes and what we should pay attention to, Hugo? Um, yeah, I mean, look, I'm all for enhancing the human being, if you want to call it that, right? And that's the way I see AI. It's it's about enhancing us as people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I personally have played around a lot with chat GPT. Um, I use it constantly. I'm always, you know, throwing questions at it and having huge discussions with it, right? Um, but also, I've got a few humans that are my human chat GPTs. Um, Antonio is one of them, actually, funny enough. Um, I like it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's 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 great that but where I think the issue is, is when people just start becoming too comfortable with it, right? So mm. I don't think it can substitute us actually knowing the things, right? So, so for example, what it does is it helps me think through it, think through an idea or think through something or, or, you know, sort of break it down or maybe give me a different perspective on what I was thinking. But I know what I'm talking about, right? I know what I'm, I'm discussing there at that time. So I can challenge it. I can also push back and say, hey, but I don't agree with that. I agree with this. You know, I think, it, and so in that sense, we have that conversation and evolves. If we become to that point where I throw a question, chat GPT will solve it and I will then use that. What will happen is I won't grow. I won't learn, you know, and, and I will stagnate. And as an industry, we will stagnate. So we have to be careful about that, right? We have to use it as an enhancer, but not as something to, to actually substitute who we are as people and what we can bring to the table, right? And I think those are the two, Positives and negatives, potentially. Yeah, yeah. 
to our uh, human chat GPT in the room, Antonio. <laughs> I'm loving that. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that in my tagline on LinkedIn. Um, I actually also love chat GPT. Um, I love it for brainstorming. It's a rubber duck, right? And it's like almost immediately available. I can just I can ask it something that I've been thinking about for a while. And like Hugo said, maybe it'll come up with a different perspective, or maybe it'll actually confirm that I was on the right path. Um, but again, I do think there are limitations, like, again, as Hugo already mentioned, when we take stuff at face value, for example, or when we just let it do all the so-called thinking mm -hmm. um, and then just run with it, right? Like, I, I, I saw some very interesting things people have done with regards to summarizing user research or just asking it for a competitive analysis. And that's a really interesting jumping off point, but you cannot stop there. I think that's something that we need to remember, but I'm super excited to see what scrappy startups are going to pop up and really utilize this technology to solve annoying problems. And, you know, which things in the PM experience that we can automate away. But again, I think we do need to be quite careful, right? Like which which decisions we're going to let a machine take. David, you mentioned uh, previously a couple of frameworks. So North Star Metrics, some, some discovery flavors. Uh, to use another one here, we should rely on the opening the, the, the diamond and not the closing step of the mm -hmm. diamond. So let's get to create uh, uh, some ideas that we will have the critical sense to evaluate and analyze uh, anything uh, to collaborate on that, chat GPT. And yeah. on top of exploration, does any of you already tried something on the output? I mean, automating the task instead of the thinking? Yeah, that's uh, something I have been reflecting because I like chat GPT. I, I think it can broaden the horizons, can help us and so on. And I really like what Hugo said, it's enhancing us as human beings. And the fear I have is about the shortcuts because some things, they just take time and we have to accept that. So I play with that sometimes and so on. And I think once I asked, how long would it take for one person to become a product manager? And it gave me a weird answer that it could take three months. And I said, ooh, that's quite interesting. So three months to become a product manager, I would say. But um, it can be quite helpful for product managers also to ramp up their knowledge. For example, I'm now in the maritime industry and I had no idea about it before. So I started uh, stumbling upon uh, several jargons and so on. So this could help me find directions and so on and to start there. But it's a starting point or it's a, it's a broadening horizon, but it's not a final point. We still need to do the thinking. We still need to do the job. And for the output, I think once we have done the thinking, then we can provide better guidance and then get an output from there. So that's what, what I would imagine doing that. But we need to be careful with shortcuts that yeah. mean by it us and can be strong. Yeah. On that one, I actually have something to add, which I've seen teams doing some great stuff around summarizing, like you've got tons of you know yeah. feedback and that can help summarize, but extracting insights that's where it goes completely wrong. <laughs> and it starts throwing complete wrong information there and confuses things completely. So again, you know, it, it, it's, it's two different uh, versions of outputs, but one is useful, the other one isn't yet. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, any good example, anything exciting, any, any, any experiment, a weekend hobby experiment you did there that would be well, well i actually have a friend i i know someone who's they they put together a new product so that which they're testing out which is synthetic users um if you go check it out but basically the concept and they're testing it out right so they don't assume that it can do the work but they're using the latest versions of chat gpt and what they're trying to do is if i feed it the questions the answers that it give me gives me would be the same answers as any users i would uh, ask in an interview and so they're going to be doing a comparison to see how actual, but so far the first results were, it was very similar, the answers, you know, and it's like, wow, this would, could change, you know, like we could focus on specific types of user research, but I don't know. 
it's just a, a, an initial experiment, right? And yeah. um, but it's it's cool. It's cool seeing that people are trying these things out, you know. And we could potentially look in and say, well, do we have to recruit five hundred users and talk to them? Maybe we don't. Yeah. You know, um, because we are kind of generic, um, you know, to an extent. You know, we mm -hmm. we like to think we're all so different, but in a lot of things we're very similar, right? But at the same time, it's also based on the inputs that the the, the AI has from what it knows, right, and what exists. So it'll be biased. It'll be biased yeah. to an extent, you know. Um, so it, it could also limit what we could do in terms of opportunities. But I don't know. I mean, we're still at the beginning, right? Knowing that is an experiment, we are trying new stuff. I think it's it's a perfectly safe field to explore and try to, to get things. Uh, knowing, as David said, sometimes the shortcuts, they, they may not be uh, the best option. Yeah, okay. Good. Uh, still on the tech platforms, tools, uh, technologies, tech to help PMs. Uh, what are the must haves and what are, are the platform roles uh, in this new scenario? So, if it's not necessarily the chat GPT to help you be more effectively, what cannot be missing on a day by day routine of a product manager uh, in your perspective, Antonia? Uh, <laughs> I love and hate this question because. <laughs> There are no essential tools, mm -hmm. except maybe the ones you need to communicate, right? Like the ones, whatever video service you are using, whatever instant messaging service you are using, and email, that's probably your essentials. Anything else, figure out if there's a problem to solve first. Figure out if you really do need to spend 50K on a mirror license or you really need Jira, or you can do with something that is free, or you can do it with a whiteboard in your home. You know, like I, I am very strongly against saying, oh, these tools are essential. This is the core tool stack of any good PM because it's so dependent on the problems you're trying to solve. I, I, I like the way this sounds, yeah. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. You don't need stuff to build solutions, right? Uh, you need to communicate because it's about connecting right. with each other. It's about learning problems, about learning context, backgrounds, and right. getting creative, uh, designing solutions. Everything else is a is a plus, is a different yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anything different than that, guys? Hugo, David? Not necessarily um, I, to replace us must-haves, but okay, it could be good to have David, a... you want to go first? I, I can go next. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I I love what Antonia said because generally the this is a tricky question I get all the time when I'm talking. And generally I say the best tool you can have is between your ears. It's your brain and your mindset. That's you need to have very sharp and bring to work every day. That needs to be working well. So if you bring that right, then it will be. Generally, I, I think it's really about how you think and uh, your orientation and having the methods in your mind. And then you can find the right tool for that. Because my fear generally about tools is like the tools start driving how we work. So the tools are not enhancing us, but they are becoming our way of working. So Jira is one of, uh, of them. I have been using this tool for, for a while. But sometimes I see it getting in the way. For example, you see these extensive comments threads there and nobody's solving the problem. It takes days, something that could take five minutes of a call. Mm -hmm. Or instead of just writing the problem, you see a description of a dozens of requirements there and people start following that and implementing solution for a problem they don't even know. So I say that this is kind of a anti-pattern that I call the kind of imagine the dog. The tail cannot wag the dog. So... <laughs> That's the problem I see. It's a kind of inversion. I do use some tools. I see they are good and so on. I uh, have my favorite, but they change over time. So what I was yeah. using 10 years ago, they have nothing to do with I'm, what I'm using now. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think I have much to add, right? Um, maybe building on that, I, I would say that it's exactly, you know, choose the tools depending on what you want to achieve rather than the other way around. Um, and like David was saying, you know, choose the tools depend. So choose the tools 
to help your process, not choose the process to adapt to the tools, right? And that's what happens often, right? Oh, we have to implement tool A. Now the whole team has to learn how to work with tool A and the process all has to change for it. To, and you're like, we've already broken it. Yeah. We're already forcing people to work in a way that they don't feel comfortable or natural working in, right? Um, and so it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's how I suggest always approach first, the process, figure out what you want to do, how you want to do it. You know, what is the approach, what, how you want to achieve the things you want to achieve. And then maybe decide, is there a tool that solves this? Or is there a group of tools or whatever? And yeah. And, and like David was saying, I've gone through hundreds of tools over the years. I've tested everything and anything possible. I'm, I'm, I'm a person who loves testing every new tool that comes on the market. So yeah, <laughs> you know, and I've dropped all of them and gone to new ones and it all depends. Always changing, right? Always. Exactly. Uh, always, them. always. Yeah. The interesting thing you, you all mentioned is we stop thinking and just adapt to using the tool. Uh, and on top of that, it may change the, the way we think about, about solving the problem. So it adapts our mindset. And uh, when we, we uh, uh, get in, in reality, we're just fulfilling forms. That's what we're doing, right? And they can um, become a blocker. They can become yeah. an actual blocker for you doing your work. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen that happening. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it becomes a blocker for innovation. It becomes, a, it becomes a blocker for you to actually accomplishing things. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, we can go one step further and, and say this about things like Scrum, right? Like seeing new startups, they grow beyond 20 people. And they're like, okay, we need to do Scrum now. It's like, why? Or because Jira comes with a Scrum preset. It's like, don't, yeah. you know, that's that should not be determining how your organization is going to work for probably the, la the rest of its life, right? Like, okay, we're going to do OKRs now because I read a blog and somebody said everybody has to do OKRs. And it's like, are OKRs going to help you you know, move forward as an organization. If yes, fantastic, you know, try it out, iterate, implement, make sure it works for your organization, but don't just jump on any framework bandwagon because somebody else said so, or because somebody led you to believe that that's the done thing. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. Uh, Antonia, I'm gonna bring something somehow connected that is a couple couple months ago we participated in some forums discussion forums uh related to product ops and i know uh some of you are experts in this field and in this these conversations in product ops a lot of the the newcomers people who are just joining all their questions are targeting which platform i should have which tools i should have <laughs> right and we're, we're just discussing that it's not necessarily about the tools right it's about uh knowing what you need in order to drive uh, business results, business outcomes. Uh, in, in this changing to be smaller, uh, uh, lean, uh, more efficient, uh, what's the role of product ops in, in, in this change? I mean, I think here it's really important to mention again what David said, right? The most important tool is the one between your ears. And yeah. it's in product ops, as much as anywhere else in the business, it's really this thinking like a PM, right? It's mm -hmm. discovering the problem, having a solution hypothesis, testing that one out in the leanest way possible, discarding it if it doesn't work, and then only really implementing it and running with it and measuring it. Once you know that this is a problem, this is a solution that we discovered works to solve this problem, right? And here it's how we're going to manage its whole life cycle. I think as far as product ops in this current sort of economic climate is concerned, it's interesting because we're seeing two things, right? Like on the one hand, product ops folk are among the first affected by layoffs um, because it's a supporting role and because we're not yet at the point where we can say we are an established function, right? Right now, a lot of companies are still taking bets on us. But at the same time, these same companies that have gone through considerable layoffs now need to rediscover their ways of working, right? Teams may have been shuffled around. Entire divisions may not exist any longer. So it's interesting that while a lot of us are getting laid off, this is actually the time where we could be the most useful. 
Yeah. Wanna comment on that, Hugo? Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's kind of going back to that whole thing around we're support role, right? And and we ultimately are a nice to have. Let's be honest. We're a nice to have because you know a product organization needs to make a conscious investment to have product operations, right? And, and that's clear. But it is a helper or a, the potential to enhance a company, right? And at this stage, I would exactly argue that it's the perfect time for you to hire even more ops people rather than letting them go. Um, because when we're talking about, you know, reducing waste, uh, in, increasing efficiency and effectiveness in the way we do things, product operations focuses and it's it's our it's an, it's our day to day, right? It's what we're always focusing on. It's it's how can teams be more effective in what they produce and how they communicate and how they connect. Um, how can we even connect them to actually the results? We're talking about business results. How do we get PMs or, or product folks to that mindset? Product ops will help, right? Define frameworks or work together with product leadership to define how we get them to that maturity level or to that. So again, you know, it, it's that type of thing where it is a nice to have, but at the same time, it's that nice to have that right now could unlock what you need. Um, and people haven't understood that yet, right? And, and again, it also depends because like every other role that ex has existed, there's a trend around product ops right now, right? Which is, oh, we have to hire product ops because everyone else is hiring product mm -hmm. ops. Uh, or we create this function and everything like that. The problem is that not everybody is ready for that role yet, right? Not everybody has got the baggage. Not everybody, you know, people who've been working for one or two years, they haven't built up the experience of, like, like Antonio was saying earlier, right? Working in agile, scrum, lean, uh, design thinking, whatever you want to call it. And then looking and saying, we're actually going to mix and match all of this, right? We're going to find the best solution that works for the organization, what for what we want to achieve, right? And so it's finding these new ways and, and not just assuming we have to do it because everybody else is doing it, right? Um, but yeah, you know, so again, there's been an influx of ops folks um, and, and sadly, you know, it's, it's, it, there's the good and there's the bad. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of attention, which is great. It's wonderful. But the problem is, you know, a lot of people still have to build up that knowledge and that baggage and, um, you know, and that being able to challenge ways of working, which is hard in a big organization or a small one, right? Turning around to someone and saying, you know what, I don't care about agile. Yeah. <laughs> People will freak out. What are you talking about? Everything is agile. You know, it's like, no, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, when you tell them, well, waterfall sometimes has to exist. <laughs> People freak out. But it's the truth, and and that's what we have to kind of help balance, right? And so, um, yeah. David, I cannot say a lot about product ops. I haven't worked with uh, anyone with this dedicated function. The only thing I can say is that I've been a very annoying product manager uh, in my life. So generally, I arrive in a place and I said. Why are we working with Scrum? And this is not Scrum, by the way, what we are doing. So what are we trying to achieve with that? So is there a reason yeah. nobody knew that? So I was always fighting and say, so why are the roadmaps feature-oriented instead of outcome-oriented? So what is the thing here? So maybe I was doing part of this job my whole life because I was fighting. Yeah. So that's my nature. I want to create a structure and a place and I don't want to uh, people doing th things for the sake of doing. So yeah, I, I believe like uh, it, it's very important, but I haven't worked directly with product ops. So it's hard to say about it. Don't worry. I've, I've worked with a lot of people who have never worked with it before. It's, it's, it's normal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's... I mean, the, the thing with product ops is that these tasks are always there. It's just sometimes they're rolled into a centralized function and a lot of the times they aren't. So a lot of people have been doing product ops or have been thinking about product ops, right? But the power in the centralized function to me is that that's our full-time job. You know, we're not going to be having it as a distraction and sort of but actually needing to do our actual full-time job. Uh, people, I'm going to have to go back to something that I confess I couldn't get uh, as we were talking. Does any of uh, uh, you work with uh, in, in leadership roles and managing teams? Managing people? Yeah? Yes and no. Yes and no. Okay, so, I, th I think um, it's good enough. I think it's good enough. Uh, bring yeah, some... I'm, I... yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. A couple, couple of sessions ago in a, a previously uh, webinar, we were talking with 
sorry, I forgot her name. Uh, VP of Product Management in Momentiv, Survey Monkey. Uh, and one of the things we were discussing is how things take time to be implemented uh, within the team. So uh, process for uh, research and how to use product analytics, not necessarily to drive your decisions, but to influence, inspire, and uh, creating new questions. So uh, she was saying, it is a process and not a, a picture. Uh, it's something that we need to uh, uh, encourage teams to try an error and then try again. Uh, but in every sprint, in every uh, time frame, they need to, to bring something new. Uh, so it's something that it needs to be done over time. At the same time, we're saying time is short now. We need to do things faster. Uh, how do you see the role of leadership as product leaders? How can we more effectively help our teams, help people uh, to onboard on this new, new scenario, uh, new mindsets, new skills? How can we help our teams to do that more effectively? Uh, Hugo, you're starting to talk about. Yeah, I think, I, I think it's, it's two things, right? And even if you have a product ops function, even if you don't, right? Even what happens is, the leadership has to be thinking about the ways of working, right? They have to think about how the organization functions and what's working and what isn't working. And they have to affect that because one of the big issues that you have in, in teams often is they can't implement the change because, oh, someone above didn't have the full buy-in, right? So if, if you turn around to a team and you say, this has to change, you're going to start using this tool or you're going to be using this process. And you don't have the VP or the top person turning around and saying, folks, this has to happen. So we need to see how we can make it happen, not in a, in a demanding way in that dictatorship, right? But actually telling them, look, this is important for us because it will have impact. And it'll be, what happens is that buy-in helps with the rest of the change, right? So people say, okay, this is important. So I have to pay attention. Um, what often happens is there's these changes that happen because one product leader remembered it, you know, like a head of product or someone from product ops or even a PM, right? They thought of something, they want to implement it, but it kind of fizzles out because the idea isn't pushed out across the org, right? And they're like, but this is, and five years down the line, someone will suggest the exact same thing. And everybody's like, oh, this is incredible. Let's do all of that, right? And it's it's missed opportunities, right? It's missed opportunities. So we have to find ways to number one, kind of get these opportunities up to the leadership and make conscious decisions. But the leadership also has to look at this and say, I have to be clear that, hey, my organization isn't that good. You know, it, things aren't going well. I have to admit that to myself. And that's one of the hardest things, you know, they have to admit when things aren't going well and make hard decisions. Um, yeah. and, and more than ever, product leaders need to also understand when to say no, yeah. right? This is important. And when to push back and say, you know what? I would love to do that. I love those feature requests you sent over, but they're not worth anything. You know, they will not bring any value to our product and to our customers. So we're going to push back and say, no, it's not going to happen, right? And so... It's 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 a balancing act. There's a there's a lot that's going to happen. They also have to become more involved in these things, but at the same time, trying not to get bogged down. Right? They have to also trust their teams and build that trust and and empower their teams. I think that's important for their teams to be almost autonomous to an extent. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Uh, anything else to add, guys? Antonia, David, feel free to join in. I mean, uh, what we're talking about here is change management, right? Like it's we are asking humans to change their behavior and that's inherently such a hard thing so and even going back to the process thing right saying okay we're doing okrs now right and people descend into chaos because they've never done it because they have a different experience with it they've done it differently some people don't agree at all so really taking them on a journey and forming these habits gradually right? Little by little, even if we are now at a crossroads where product leaders say, okay, we have to invest in discovery so that we don't spend time building stuff that doesn't work. That's a muscle. That's a habit. What's the smallest piece of discovery you can do today? And then what's the next smallest piece you can do tomorrow? And so on. It's, it is a process, right? It's a journey. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. Hmm. Yeah. I agree fully. And what I see is like for leaders, many leaders uh, try picturing the future and say, that's where we are going to go and so on. Very beautiful. That's what we are pursuing, name the metric or what is important. But then they forget this step. It might be very far from where the team is right now. And 
it's like you are on the top of the mountain and then you start shouting miles away from the team and you hope they listen to you. Great leader would picture the top of the mountain, go down and then meet the team one step ahead of them and say, okay, here's my hand. Let's go together on this now. So that's what I need right now to so provide in the constraints. So I think you show the top of the mountain and you start providing what you can do today and showing the constraints. But it's not about micromanaging. It's about helping them step by step. And accepting that might be that some things, if you were previously on the road, you would do faster. You still need to help them build the muscle and support and so on. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, creating the process of change, uh, it demands creating trust, right? Creating a, establish a relationship of trust. Uh, granting uh, uh, space to execute autonomy uh, with responsibility. I think it's it's a whole set of things. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex thing. Being a product leader is not easy. Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. not. Especially people think it's just it's just deciding. Oh yes, do this or do that. But it's not. It, there's a lot of work that for a good product leader, right? <laughs> so there are some leaders that will just turn around and say, "Team, work on stuff. We need results." But um, for a good product leader, yes, it takes effort. And uh, the the pressure and the scarce uh, uh, scenario makes everything more challenging. But it's when we are most challenged uh, is when we uh, uh, have the ability to be more creative. So excited to see what the, these new times are, are, are bringing to us. Okay, I think we're reaching uh, the end of this. Uh, we're gonna uh, get a couple minutes to do the Q and A. And if nothing new uh, comes in, uh, I think we can call it a day. Uh, let's see if we have something. And I'll bring one question for the audience. Uh, it, when we start talking about platforms and tools, I think people uh, got anxious about it. Uh, so we got a question about tools and platforms. And then I'll bring uh, one question from my own uh, to complete this conversation today. So the question goes like, Following up on the question about tools, when do you know that it's time to get a tool? We, we mentioned, uh, don't focus on getting platforms and, and, and technology, focus on understanding what you need. And then if you need something, go uh, search for the best solution for the need that you have. Is there a ratio of time spent with a task or process that means you need to bring automation technology? So in terms of let's get what we need, Good criteria to analyze and to this, the decide when uh, you need something. Who wanna go? Antonia, you wanna start? I'll go. Um, I mean, right when we talk about product management, we talk about problem discovery. And the two sort of crucial aspects are, does this problem exist? And is this problem acute enough that people would be willing to spend money on solving it? Right. I mean, this you could also use this for any kind of other product that provides the light rather than solves the problem. The concept is still the same. And I think it's exactly those questions that you need to ask yourself. Right. Does this problem exist? Yes. In this case, it looks like this is a process that happens fairly regularly. But now does it happen regularly enough or is it painful enough? for me to invest in getting a tool because getting a tool isn't just putting the money down, right? It's education. It's setting it up. It's making sure it connects to all your other tools and making sure that the people outside of the product organization understand that they now need to go to this new place if it does impact them. So there's actually a lot more at stake when we talk about tool introduction. So yeah, I would really bring it back to those two questions, right? Is this problem present and is it acute enough for you to invest the time and money you need to make this a successful transition? I love that. I wouldn't add anything. <laughs> <laughs> David? Me neither. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I agree fully. Okay. And uh, to finish, I want to bring something from my my personal feelings and uh, daily routine on, on the company and on the product. And I would like to invite you to share uh, if you think you have something similar uh, to the situation. That is, what's the one thing that you feel is causing your uh, product organization or the operations to be less effective than it could be? 
at least if we could fix one thing uh, that we don't have here, uh, what is this one thing that should be the top priority to, to risk on the to-do list and to bring here? And uh, to make it a, a short story, uh, we are pivoting and changing and adapting the, the startup since early uh, 2018. And we've run a lot of different discovery uh, cycles and sessions and discovery with different product visions and product definitions and different personas. And the one thing I feel could bring more uh, uh, effectiveness and speed to the process is centralizing, documenting the learnings, even from previously uh, uh, previous uh, uh, discovery sessions, because I know, I, I feel that uh, we could learn even from old exploration and something that we, we missed and we didn't see before could be useful uh, currently. So not documenting, centralizing, and making it available, the result of all the exploration research we do, uh, centralizing something like a repository for research resources uh, is something that could be helpful to, to the organization. So I don't know if it's a combination of process and technology, but this is something I feel uh, could help our organization to be more effective. Uh, does any of you have something similar to specific that risk uh, as, as done uh, could have a good impact? I have one. Uh, I think it's uh, the product principles. So a lot of organizations define product vision, OKRs, and so on, but they don't talk enough about product principles. Mm. What do we follow? What do we care about? And if you have the principles agreed with everyone, so what do you prioritize and so on in your daily doing? A simple thing about, for example, design. At some point in time, you need to decide do you go for something intuitive or do you go for something you need to provide a clear guidance or so on? Or if you have a, a dual side, like a marketplace, who do you prioritize? Sellers or buyers? When you come to a decision, this needs to be clear. It needs to be a principle. For example, um, you could, could say buyers even over sellers. This is from the, the decision stack framework uh, by Martin Erickson. And I think it's amazing because if you have this, it accelerates uh, mm -hmm. decision and it improves collaboration because it, uh, everyone knows the direction we are going. Let's skew a discussion, right? One yeah, exactly. Discussion. Yeah. Yeah, you avoid the discussion, so you start saying, "Okay, but how? Who do you prioritize now, buyer or seller?" No, that's a principle. We know that if it comes to this point, we know what to do. Yeah, and even operating principles, right? Um, before even going into processes, right? Yeah. How do we work as a company? How do we connect as a company and, and these types of things? Because they, they will actually create the space for even organic processes, right? Because people will have those guiding principles. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's it's building on those, the, the product principles and almost operating principles, right? And they can be one in one in the same, you know, if you if done right. Um, if you want to talk about research repos, we can go into that a bit more in detail, but <laughs> Antonia. Yeah, I mean, mine, I honestly don't think anyone can solve um, in, in a short amount of time, but it's going back to remembering that we're just humans working with other humans, doing things for other humans, mm -hmm. right? Like there is so much, and, and especially in product management and product ops, there's so many prioritization frameworks or stakeholder management maps, and we're just humans, like just let's talk to each other like let's make sure we have those principles and and then work together around those principles to do something to build something to create something i feel like that has almost gotten a little bit lost lately yeah yeah it's a checklist of frameworks to get right. through every project right <laughs> oh i've done this 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 and that okay it's done right if it if i haven't done everything yeah no, that's true um trying to connect the things uh, we, we heard a couple of minutes ago when we're talking about how to promote more effectiveness on teams and how leadership can help grow uh, the trust on their teams to have autonomy and make decisions and uh, speed up the process of getting maturity. The principles have a, a role in that, right? So things that, does, that doesn't have to be questioned or asked uh, or discussed, they grant you uh, I don't know, security uh, and safety uh, to make decisions. So we just rely and make the decision you go, knowing that this is already predefined. So uh, a good way of uh, speeding up maturity on the teams. 
Yeah, and it kind of puts everyone behind a sort of no. vision, right? Or it, no. it, everybody's on the same boat. They understand where they're going. You know, it's similar to the whole, uh, there's the, the TDT talk from Simon Sinek, right? Around start with the why, where he describes where Apple, um, and even his old book around that, right? How they start with the why, which is basically what you're doing. You know, why is this important for us? Why is why Why are we working on this product? Why are we who we are? Right. And then you go into it. Oh, by the way, we also build a product. Right. Because what happens is people get behind that vision, that feeling. Um, and then they, but at the same time, they all know those are the parameters. Right. That's that, that's my block. That's where I fit in. Um, you know, and like David was saying, if we're only focusing on people who are buying, let's just focus on those. I won't get lost. Oh, but this is a cool opportunity. It is. And we can look at it in five years' time, maybe. But for now, this is our focus. Yeah. And just focus on that right and it helps bring people back to that place that's the difference between leadership driving and leadership micromanagement uh, micromanaging so we need exactly. direction right yeah exactly yeah i think we can call it a day folks uh we're at the top of the hour uh it was amazing i certainly learned a lot here i hope it was as fun and useful and enjoying to you as it was for me uh, i want to thank Thank you for, for the time and for uh, all the inputs and for all the, the content and knowledge shared and created here. Uh, hope to see you guys in the next one. Yeah. Thank you so much. And, and thank, thank you. And thanks for asking some of the hard questions. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for the courage to answer that. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Awesome. Bye. Bye.